engineering at uh, Monash University in Melbourne. Um, he's not only a brilliant researcher, but he actually knows how to put the, uh, the innovations we do at university and uh, make something useful out of it and uh, create a business with it. Um, in 1996, he founded uh, Virtual Photonics, PTY Limited, which uh, is now, I think, uh, BPI, yep. and uh, which has grown into the leading supplier for design tools for communications and components in the world. He's an international expert on optical fiber communications, and uh, really one of the pioneers, or the pioneer, on uh, optical uh, OFDM, optical frequency division multiplexing, um, which is uh, the use of uh, OFDM algorithms uh, to mitigate dispersion and, uh, in optical uh, links. He's a fellow of the IEEE and the uh, Australian Academy of uh, Technology, Science and Engineering. And uh, he will give us an introduction to optical OFDM. Yes, I'm here, so thank you very much. Um, Okay, it's been a busy two days because I just picked up a new member of staff yesterday very early at Melbourne Airport. Drove to Monash and then drove back to Melbourne Airport. I can't I go back. So, this is where Monash University is. That's uh, Melbourne. And if you go southeast by about 24 kilometres, you get to Monash University. There's a synchrotron here in case anyone wants to use it. And uh, engineering is here, CSIRO is here. And so the building just started here where CSIRO and engineering work together. So, let's go. Um, so, I, I guess I'm uh, a little bit different than most people here um, in that I'm going to talk about. Um, communications based on lots of slow rate channels rather than communications based on shorter and faster pulses. Um, I hope that you'll take away from this um, some different viewpoints on optical communications and some different ways of thinking about optical communications. Um, and uh, here we go. So, uh, this actually was the uh, diagram that we raised six million dollars with, um, so it's quite interesting, uh, for Ophidium, which is uh, a company I founded a couple of years ago, and now is run by Jonathan Lacey, uh, who used to work at Melbourne University, but then worked for Agilent and then Callion, the optical switch company. So he's a very experienced chap. Um, so that's in Melbourne, in Burke Street. Which is a very nice location. Um, so the, the argument here, we were talking about 10 gigabits per wavelength, which is rather slow nowadays. But uh, for dispersion um, in the fiber, you can go up to about 80 kilometers before you need to compensate for fiber dispersion. If you want to go beyond 80 kilometers, there are a number of techniques you can use. Uh, initially, people were talking about uh, alternative modulation uh, formats like duo binary was one put forward to go a little bit further. Um, of course, optical dispersion compensation has been around for a long time, and this is just uh, dispersion compensating fiber wrapped in spools and inserted between amplifiers roughly every 80 kilometers. There's also people making Bragg ratings uh, with high uh, negative dispersion to compensate for fiber dispersion. And in the last few years, since uh, about five years ago, there's been electrical and electronic techniques proposed for compensating dispersion. So initially, uh, companies like Core Optics, which has just been bought by Sienna, um, used some fancy electronic techniques to try and work out the ones and zeros from the sort of smeared waveform that comes out of a dis dispersive fiber. Uh, Siemens did some work on microscript filters, so these are analog electrical filters. Um, and 
digital filters were various companies who actually used them in multi-mode fibers. So there were some papers taken out uh, and they're used to extend the reach of multi-mode fibers. So they all occur at the receiver. The big change really was Nortel and electronic pre-distortion where they used a complex optical modulator, I'll explain in a moment, um, in order to first calculate uh, the output of a dispersion compensating fiber and then send it through the real fiber. And for this, you need to um, impose the correct optical phase on the waveform you're transmitting. And they've got some spectacular results of 5,000 kilometers and actually have a system that they sell um, and have sold quite a lot of it actually. So we came along with OFDM. This was developed jointly by me and Professor Gene Armstrong of Monash University, um, which is a technique used in radio communications to overcome dispersion in uh, wireless systems. And we showed that you could go similar distances to electronic pre-distortion. More recently, there's been electronic post-compensation, where you take a coherent optical receiver, and a coherent optical receiver will provide you with the optical phase, as well as the amplitude, which allows you to undo the dispersion, which is phase distortion in the fiber. So, uh, this was also part of our argument to raise money. Um, what we were saying is, you could go about 200 kilometers. If you send a, a digital waveform, ones and zeros, through fiber, about 200 kilometers, it comes out like this, that the individual ones are a little bit smaller. And you can put these various electronic techniques on the end of a photodiode and uh, try and work out the ones and zeros much better and reduce the error rate. And the diode destroys the optical phase um, simplistically, so all you've got is the intensity of the power waveform, the optical power waveform, and so you can't undo much dispersion, but you can undo some. You can see that was all around 2005. This was the Nortel technique, where you use pre-distorter and what this says is, in our fiber, blue goes faster than red. So if we have an electronic circuit which sends blue first, so it sends red first, so red comes along first, and blue second, uh -huh. perfect. So we send red first, and then we send blue second, then as they go along the fiber, they will synchronize, and when they hit the photodiode, you'll have a perfect waveform. So you send a pre-distorted waveform that looks awful, and by the time it gets to the end of the dispersive fiber, it looks good again, and you need a simple receiver. The problem with this system um, was that, well, the fiber gets disturbed, uh, its characteristics change, or you switch in an alternative path along the route, and so you need some control signals coming back and that was generally not liked by telecommunications operators. They don't want a path from the receiver to the transmitter saying, hang on, the received pulses aren't that great, can you change the distortion? Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, OFDM was a technique where you didn't need this uh, feedback path. First, I'm going to go through a few optical communication systems requirements, though. Um, probably you know all these. One of the most important specifications of an operator is, uh, is optical signal-to-noise ratio. And you've got to get this right. It's really the signal channel per wavelength channel, signal power per wavelength channel, divided by the noise power 0.1 nanometers measured in both polarizations. And the reason it's that is that if you buy most spectrum analyzers, they has a they well they have used to have a resolution of 0.1 nanometers. 
which is 12 and a half gigahertz. Um, and when you read the display, it would give you this uh, denominator. And so OSNR was a thing that was easily measured by people. Now OSNR is destroyed by optical amplifiers, it reduces as you go along the link, but uh, a technician can measure what the OSNR is at the end of the link and see if it's good enough to support a certain data rate. Um, if you look at it in the spectral domain, uh, the signal power, you can increase the transmitting power, you can reduce the losses, you can put more amplifiers in to make that bigger. And the noise power, every time you put an amplifier in, you get a little bit more noise added. This is a sort of additive process. Every amplifier produces a certain amount of noise. You can also reduce the bandwidth of the noise with optical filters, but as soon as you squeeze the um, filters too much, you start squeezing the signal, and that destroys its integrity. Electronics can put it right a bit, so you can squeeze it down quite a lot. And people have been showing that if you use some maximum likelihood algorithms, even with quite a narrow channel bandwidth, you can recover the data. Um, OSNR, there's a, an equation called the 58 equation, uh, not so much in the literature, but by the people who install optical fiber communication systems which says that the OSNR that you get is the transmitted power minus the loss between the amplifiers along the link, so each span from one amplifier to another, minus the noise figure of an amplifier, which is usually about 3 dB, unless it's a Raman amplifier, uh, minus 10 log the number of amps, plus 58, and that's where 58 dB comes from. So, we can work out what an OSNR will be, say if we transmit minus 5 dBm, which is typical. We've got 20 dB loss, which is say 100 kilometers of fiber. We will take 5 dB amplifiers. Um, we've got uh, 10 uh, spans, so 10, 10 on 10 is that, plus 58, gives us 18 dB of OSNR. And that's, hello, so it might be more convenient, but this is more fun. <laughs> Not people on the head and make comments. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it's sufficient to support 120 gigabits with 4 dB margin. The other thing this has got is mass, which means that it's more stable. You see, if I use this, it usually wobbles all over the place. And you have to find what end it is. Whereas <laughs> this is nice and stable. This is what they use on you know, Japanese artists to keep themselves steady. Uh, so, here we go. Um, other things, you need to be immune to fiber dispersion, uh, which I've explained some of the techniques. Uh, of course, in this workshop, there'll be talk on mid span spectral inversion. Uh, there's been companies, um, have been companies that have tried mid-span spectral inversion um, use, using pole lithium niobate. And this is where in the middle of the link you swap the spectrum around and essentially all the dispersion then acts in the opposite way because what was red becomes really blue and what was blue becomes red and uh, it goes on its merry way and then does all the problems. So, um, yes, uh, I won't give any analogies there. And then there's electronic dispersion compensation. There's also stuff called polarization mode dispersion, which is uh, really painful, but can be undone with electronics. Um, fiber nonlinearity is a big problem, unless you like solitons. Uh, Nick Duran likes solitons, good friend of mine. Um, and has spent 20 years liking solitons. There is actually a soliton link across to Perth, Adelaide to Perth, which was called IP1, uh, that um, Nick designed. And uh, I've got lots of interesting stories about installing that, which 
can't say on video. Um, so, you must be tolerant to find a non-linearity. Um, now, what Nick was saying to me in Berlin for a long time was, you guys with OFTM, all you do is turn down the power and non-linearity goes away. Well, that is a very good way of getting rid of non-linearity. But if you turn down the transmitter power, you also uh, reduce the signal-to-noise ratio, which means you can reduce the amount of data you can send down the link. So ideally, you, you'd be able to turn up the power and then compensate for non-linearity. The limit of power is called the non-linear Shannon limit, and I'll show you a graph later on. Um, if we can compensate for non-linearity, we can make the non-linear Shannon limit into the Shannon limit, which cannot be exceeded, and that will give us the maximum capacity of our link, the maximum bits per hertz of spectral bandwidth. So some of the solutions, large core fibers, air cord fibers, mid-span spectral inversion, and electronic non-linearity compensation, which I'll talk about later on the talk. So why is electronic dispersion so good? This is where I duck behind the bench here. There's, Ben's not here, but uh, normally he'll tell me it's bad. Um, you can replace optics with electronics. Why would you do that? Well, CMOS circuits are very cheap and they get better by the year. So there's some sayings in the industry that you can never beat CMOS. Um, it's not quite true. I'll give you a few examples where it's not quite true. Um, you can upgrade the software or the firmware in the chip very easily. So if you come up with a better algorithm, you've got these chips called field programmable gate arrays. You just tell them how they wire themselves up, and if you get it wrong the next minute, you tell them how to wire themselves up again. And these things are extremely powerful. They're processors with hundreds of multipliers inside them that you can um, wire up and make a big parallel algorithm to do Fourier transforms really quickly. Not quite as quickly as optics. Um, you can put the complexity at the ends of the link rather than the middle, and that's useful in Australia because no one wants to drive out to the mi middle of the Nullarbor Desert to repair uh, some fancy bit of electronics or optics uh, and then drive back again. In fact, they don't drive, they have a light plane just to ensure the reliability of the link. So if something goes wrong, they can fly from Perth, mend it and fly back again. Otherwise, it's a day and a half drive. And that's a lot of minutes that you're not making revenue on your um, communications link. Uh, so it wants to be plug and play. You don't want uh, uh, to have PhDs installing optical communications links. You just want cheap labor who just plug it in, turn it on, and then go to the next place. Um, you want it to be able to support rapidly changing network topologies. So if the fiber breaks, you can route the signal around another fiber, and the length will change, and so the dispersion will change. Well, you want the electronics to cope with that. You really want to reduce the risk that the network won't work, because if a network doesn't work, everybody gets annoyed because their web pages don't work, they sue you, and your share price goes down. It's really bad in telecoms to have a network that goes off. Um, also, the clock recovery issues are, are much easier. Um, we can do efficient numerical computation using these fast chips. And thrown in for free, if you're solving dispersion um, uh, electronically, you automatically get all the coefficients so you're monitoring the status of the link and you're seeing whether it's getting worse and worse over time and if it's likely to fail, for example. But the electronic dispersion compensation, I think, is forte is a greater polarization mode dispersion compensation. So rather than having a big rack, which is a PMD compensator with mechanical parts, it's all done electronically with no moving parts. 
and you don't want moving parts because sales go wrong. So OFDM is a very efficient way of doing um, dispersion compensation. So what it does is it splits your signal, which is maybe 100 gigabits per second, into many, many narrow bandwidth channels. Each could be 100 megabits per second. And as we know from many, many years ago, um, they were transmitting 100 megabits per second in sort of, um, well, the, the 80s, that you don't need dispersion compensation. So each channel is very dis uh, tolerant to dispersion. Um, we can generate many channels, not by having many lasers, but by having a Fourier transform. I'll show you this in a moment. We can then split up those channels at the receiver, not by using a grating, but by using another fast Fourier transform. So we're replacing optics with electronics here. It's also a rather mature uh, technology used in all sorts of communications links. But one of its greatest advantages is that the processing is n log n. Uh, so it scales at high bit rates. If you want to go from 10 to 40 gigabits per second, processing increases by about a factor of six. If you use other le electronic techniques like MLSE, then you'd start to need thousands of times more processing if you increase the data rate by a factor of four. So it's scalable. It will get better and better without throwing too much money at it. Any questions yet? Maybe we can ask questions after this one. So here's a typical OFDM system. And it's got some components that uh, you may know and some that might, you might not know. So we take our data channels, which are low data rates. It could be one high data rate channel split up into lots of low data rate channels. And we modulate each one. And that means uh, we map the binary bits onto amplitude and phase of our optical signal. Um, I'll explain that a bit later. And then we use an inverse FFT. And all this does really is it says these are coefficients for each frequency. So there's an amplitude and phase for each frequency coming in. The inverse FFT simply generates a load of sine waves and adds them together. And each sine wave is at a different frequency, and each sine wave has a phase and an amplitude dependent on the data. This all comes out in parallel from the algorithm, so we convert it into serial, and we have a real signal and an imaginary signal. They're both real, really, they're both traveling wires. So uh, normally we call the real bit of the I in phase, the Q, the quadrature for the imaginary part. And then we can uh, up-convert them, multiply them by a cos and a sine, and get a real waveform that we send along our radio link um, or our fiber link. So this generates a big cone of signals. At the receiver, we convert our real uh, signal, which is at some frequency, into um, a real and imaginary part at baseband, so near DC. And then we convert those analog signals into digital signals, convert them into a parallel waveform, throw them at the Fourier transform, and that tells you the amplitude and phase of each frequency. We can then equalize them, which generally means just tweaking the phase slightly of each channel and that compensates for the different speeds each channel travels along the link. A uh, very simple multiplication per channel, sometimes called a one-tap equalizer. But you have to know what an n-tap equalizer is if you want to understand the one-tap equalizer. So it's just a phase multiplication. Then we demod, so we turn the phase and amplitude back into data bits, throw it out again. So any questions on that? That's uh, Sort of electronics in. Um, phase, um, which is available after the modulation, is it absolute phase of the, of the relative phase? Oh, that's the key. That, um, well, there's no such thing as absolute phase.
except if you use MATLAB or something and you start with you know, element one in the matrix and you say that's zero time. In reality, um, there's no absolute phase unless you went back to the beginning of the universe and I don't think anyone can calculate when that happens that accurately. Anyway, um, and uh, so what you have to do is you send pilot tones with a known phase. So some of these data channels could actually have data that is known or just a, a constant CW phase and then you can compare with that. There's also algorithms that from the actual data bits you can find um, the correct phase as a Viterbi, Viterbi algorithm which is quite famous for that. So the radio people have ways of finding phase. But uh, you know, when some people implement this in reality, they go, well, hang on, how do I get absolute phase? Um, one way is to use a little sneak wire from the transmitter to the receiver, but that's cheap on. So how does this work? Well, this is a, a musical analogy. So what most people used to do is send ones and zeros, one was a note, and a beep, 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 beep sort of thing. And if you wanted to send more data, you send more notes. That's a beep, 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 and, you, and eventually what happens is they all smear into each other. So if you went into a big echoey building, like a cathedral, and you started playing really, really fast guitar solos, it would all just end up a great big splurgy mess. Uh, and that's what happens here, that the blue parts travel faster than the red parts, and the ones and zeros all get smerged, new word for today, um, into one. So the beauty of OFDM is it's like some forms of jazz music where you play this big chord which is really complex and there are lots of notes in that you don't expect are really complex. Lay down the chord and then everyone listens to it until the next bar. And while they're listening to it, they're going, oh, that's a strange chord. It's got a ninth and a seventh or a diminished sixth or something in it. And, and so the interesting, the interest in the music is the complexity of the chord. So what we do is we send lots of parallel data channels, all like different notes, and we play them all at once, which I can't sing lots of notes all at once. So I've only got one voice box. And we then let them die away, and then we play another chord. And the data is in essentially the phases of the notes we play and the loudness of each individual note. Now, when they spread out, the blue ones go a bit faster than the red ones, but as long as we leave a little bit of a guard band here, until we play the next chord, um, there's no effect of dispersion. And that's what OFDM does. Um, this is a little bit more detail. I'm looking for the clock in those places. transform of that, then it goes wrong. For example, if I took this red tone, which is a sine wave, and it's delayed, then it's not there for the first bit of the Fourier transform, and then it's there the rest. And this is now aperiodic. So rather than being a sine wave that 
is enclosed between those boundaries, and continuous across the boundaries, so that point and that point at the same level, it's got a jump in it, discontinuity. And when you have a signal with a discontinuity, say this red subcarrier, it spreads out. So a very short note um, will have lots of frequencies. That's what uh, bass guitarists get away with, they play the wrong note, it's so short it doesn't matter. Um, uh, particularly T-chest bass guitarists in the old days where they had a T-chest and a broom handle with a string and just a thud, because it was such a short note, containing lots of frequencies. However, this is bad because what it's saying is the information in that red subcarrier is spread across all the other subcarriers and leaks into them, so it doesn't work. And this is why we use a, a nice trick called a cyclic prefix, where digitally we take the end of the note, and copy and paste it, and stick it on the beginning. <coughs> and this means that if we get the dispersion through the fiber, and we take our Fourier transform, which is still one original symbol long, then even though this bit of the symbol has gone out of the Fourier transform window, uh, the copy of it has come in the other end. And the sine wave uh, is um, periodic again, and that means there's no leakage between the channels. And that's where the orthogonality comes from. That each of these is totally independent. There's no leakage. It's not like having an optical filter that doesn't reject the adjacent channels. There's just mathematically no leakage in the system. That's where OFDM comes from. So I'll skip equalization. Skip that one. Now, there are a number of OFDM uh, flavors, if you like. Uh, at Monash, we initially worked on direct detection OFDM, which uh, comes in two flavors itself. There's double sideband, which is a sort of easy one, where you just take the signal and modulate an optical signal, and you get two sidebands, you get the carrier and the sidebands. The trouble is that these travel at different speeds. And so when you detect the signal, you get phase cancellation of some frequencies, and you can see there are nulls in the spectrum. You can do various tricks, like try and avoid the nulls. Don't send information on those. Um, we were working on single sideband OFDM, where you only send single optical sideband, so it's got nothing to interfere with, and it produces an electrical signal which uh, has no nulls. And that works really well. And we were the first to publish that in um, 2005, 2006. Coherent OFDM is where you don't send the carrier. So if you normally modulate a carrier, you get a sideband and the carrier. If you get rid of the carrier somehow, using a fancy modulator, for example, then you just send the sideband. To do the detection, you have to regenerate the carrier at the receiver, and this requires another laser or local oscillator. Bill Shea at Melbourne um, pioneered work on coherent OFDM. So, uh, some things don't really need to know that. Don't need to know that. I guess the interesting thing with OFDM, and I've said this in 2007, was there's many ways to implement it. So we can use different components. We can use simple optical modulators. We can use RF mixers. We can send different types of data formats. Um, we can do tricks for your transform to change the spectrum. We can use different numbers of digital to analog converters. So we can use lots of slow ones or one really fast one. Um, we can use RF components. So you all know about frequency conversion in the optical domain. Well, you can buy these little RF components that will convert 
uh, around 15 gigahertz worth of information up and down the frequency spectrum in the RF domain. So you can do sort of mixing uh, in RF, same as you can do in optics. Um, we can apply various things to, to um, drive the modulator, to pre-distort the signal going to the modulator to correct its characteristics. And we can use many different types of modulators, we can put filters in there. We can put the hermation and use a complex modulator to automatically generate a single cyber. So actually it was a very fervent research field and what happened over the last few years, so from 2007 onwards, is there's been lots of papers published on various combinations of these, um, showing which is best. Don't really need all that. So just to show that it works, this is basically what it is. Uh, that's an arbitrary waveform generator. It's like a, a souped up MP3 player. Um, you give it a USB stick and it spurts out analog signals based on the digital input. They go to the simple microwave amplifier that's modulated here. There's the laser. That's the receiver, which is a little photodiode and amplifier. That's the spectrum. So, quite a simple setup. The complexity is in the electronics at the end. That's an 800 kilometer link. That's a, a little microwave amplifier, a little modulator. So, pretty simple actually. Um, and what you get out of the link is a, a sort of donut like this. And that's because you started off transmitting points. And this is a, a, an argand diagram, real and imaginary. And to send two bits of data, you put the signal at four different phases. So 45 degrees, uh, 135 degrees, blah, 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 on and on. And when they come at the end, each of these dots is a different frequency. The phase along the fiber, the phase shift, due to its chromatic dispersion, produces a donut. And then we use an equalizer, which applies a quadratic phase shift, and puts the spots where they're supposed to be. You want these spots to be distinct because you put some thresholds across the axes and you say any dot that's in this lower quadrant is, for example, a 1 and a 0. And that's a 1 and a 1. That's a 0 and a 1. That's a 0 and a 0. If a little dot goes across the threshold, it's an error. Um, so if we want to send more information, then we just put more dots. So instead of having um, four different phases, here we have three different amplitudes and a number of different phases. This is called the 16 plant modulation format. Uh, this will send four bits every dot, every uh, OF DM7 carrier. That's a way of increasing the spectral efficiency of the link. Um, this is just what, what it looks like. Uh, these are the time waveforms. This is the Fourier transform in the electrical domain. That's your OFDM signal. This is various noise that you don't want. But it doesn't matter because it's outside the band of what you do want. Any questions on that? Because I have some sort of submit papers and people say, what's all these? What's that? It doesn't look like a waveform. Well, it's a constellation diagram and it's used a lot in radio transmission for many, many years. And essentially you want the cluster of dots to represent a different bit of data, but noise or distortion will put a dot in the wrong place that will cause an error. Hi. Okay. Um, what's the maximum bandwidth in front of the Oh, well, the data rates we've achieved, are, we've got some 120 gigabits per second, um, that's the sort of optical spectrum we've sent. And the thing here is we've sent lots of data at low frequencies and less data at high frequencies. Um, and the 
Lots of data at low frequencies is 16 quam. Those are the individual dots, but at high frequencies, the components don't work so well, so you could, each dot spreads out more, so you have fewer of them. That, that gives uh, 120 gigabits per second. Down the and is that limited mainly by the electronics, or...? Um, the well, yes. Uh, it's... It's limited. There's an ultimate limit due to the um, electronics, which is the speed of the digital to analog converters and the resolution of the digital to analog converters. And this is where optics uh, could make an advance. Um, and then you've got the normal limitations of uh, amplitude, uh, sorry, amplified spontaneous emission from all the amplifiers. And then if you want to turn the power up, you've got the limit due to non-linearity. And I'll show you how to solve that during a break. So, so next topic is fiber non-linearity and how to mitigate it for a hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been probably for some of you a little bit different. Um, it was a lot different to me five years ago because I was used to generating sort of mobile laser pulses and sending those down the mix. And uh, this is a, a different way of looking at things, an orthogonal approach. Hi. Um, but I could say that you showed the Peter rates about 20 minus, 20 minus 4. Yeah. Isn't that sort of compared to the well, expected of the system quite? Well, that's, that's before forward error correction. So all optical systems now have lots of electronics at the end called forward uh, error compensation, which basically sends a few more bits that you need. And those few more bits can detect an error and correct an error. So if you feed uh, a, a raw bit error ratio of 10 to the minus 3, or even 2 times 10 to the minus 3, into one of these chips, you'll get 10 to the minus 15 out. Um, and that's beautiful. Uh, a lot of people used to design optical comm systems to work at a raw error rate of 10 to the minus 15, which was A, very difficult to measure, especially at low data rates, it would take days. But B, any small imperfection in any of the components would give you a big error rate. With forward error correction, lots of electronics, it's beautiful because you can operate at these lower error rates, or higher error rates, more errors, which require less OSNR. Um, but they're also easier to monitor the system because every thousand bits is wrong. And if suddenly every two in every thousand bits becomes wrong, you can go, ah, something's going wrong, I'm slipping here. I have to send a technician out to do something. Um, so people like to operate systems at fairly high error rates now because you know when the system's about to fall over. And then you just correct it with FEC chips. There are starting to be more second generation FEC chips that can work at error rates up to some 10 to minus 2. Uh, and there's an overhead, there's a 20% overhead. So if you want to send 5 bits, you have to send 6. And the 6 bit, or you should say, you, know, um, you send 200 and so many bits, and uh, 50 of those bits are able to detect or correct the errors electronically. So forward error correction, or FEC, as everyone calls it, which means stealing apples in Irish, um, uh, uh, is, um, is widely used in optical communication. Yep. Um, can you comment on like, approaches uh, on doing the Fourier transform or optical? Yeah. Um, Good. I've just written a paper. If you look at Optics Express, it's probably in forthcoming issues. Hopefully, we pay the bill and it's in real issues. 
um, on this. You can do optical Fourier transforms, as you all know. A lens is a good optical Fourier transform. A network of optical fibers and couplers is a good Fourier transform, though a little bit difficult to control. Um, what I've proposed is using uh, an array waveguide grating router uh, as a Fourier transform, um, and a bit more than a Fourier transform. It also does the parallel to serial conversion, or the serial to parallel conversion. Um, and the beauty of that really is most Fourier transforms, they take a set of samples of a waveform. So the, if you've got a waveform like that, it will take a set of samples using your analog to digital converter and it will then process them, which basically means adding them all together with a set of different weights, so complex number of multiplications, adding, and that's the output. Um, the beauty of an optical Fourier transform is that these points are continuous in time, that there's still four discrete points, but they're sliding along. And so you're actually getting lots of Fourier transforms in parallel. And maybe that's that's interesting. Um, the non-beauty about it is you tend to need more electronics at the end because if you've got four samples, you need four sets of uh, analog to digital converters, albeit at a lower rate. So it's a trade-off. Do you use lots of slow-speed electronics or a few bits of high-speed electronics? Any? No one's thrown anything at me yet. You know, like, why don't you do it all optically? Or not? Why don't you do Fourier transform optically? There will always be electronics in communication systems because at the end it has to drive a video screen and you watch. I remember there was a proposal in the photonics CRC about 15 years ago where Mark Steets, the related leader of the Australian Photonics CRC, said, What we'll do is we'll hover an optical fiber above an optical disc and as it rotates, um, we'll get a different amount of reflection into the fibre and we'll directly connect that to the other side of the world. Um, which may have worked and it would have been all optical, but I guess would lose some of the things like buffering, which is very difficult to do in um, optics. So as the read head scans across the disc, and you're not putting any data across it, why waste the optical communications link um, and have it on standby while there's no actual data being generated? So I think that for buffering, you tend to need um, electronics. That's probably insulted anyone from the slow light ratio. <laughs> no, no one's here for the slow light. Okay. So, um, after the break, if there's time for a break, how far away? <coughs> yeah.